in terms of playoff caliber teams, if I had to end the season today, which I'm glad I don't, there's six to eight teams from the big sky who are going to be playoff eligible. I see four teams from the Valley. And then you're probably looking at about six teams from the CAA who are in that playoff contention as well. Welcome to the official podcast of FCS Fans Nation with your hosts, Kyler Neal, Matthew Frazee, and Jamie Williams. FCS fans nation welcome back hopefully your week was amazing I'm guessing for a lot of you in the top 25 it was not uh, but we're gonna discuss that a little bit further welcome to the FCS fans nation podcast I am here with the biggest Aggie fans on the planet Jamie Williams Kyler Neal rocking some new merch gear tonight if you're joining us on YouTube I'm sticking with my Stephen F. Austin hat from Last Stand Hats in Central Arkansas, the Bears. So I'm sticking with my purple and white here tonight. Gentlemen, you are looking great in those uh, Aggie Bulldog t-shirts. Um, was this a planned thing, Kyler, or what? Or is this just completely random? I mean, I, I figured he would wear it, but it's random. I mean, whenever we get a new shirt from some awesome person on our page, we're probably going to rock it right away. So uh, this was from Amos. So we appreciate it. It was a tough game for you, but I saw the pictures online. It looks like, did you see the photos, Matt? It looks like I, he had a blast in Fargo riding dude. a bull. I think that's what I saw. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. Oh, I, I don't know buddy. if it was a bull, but he had like, you know, he was ready. He was doing something. But um, Taco Brian took really good care of Amos and kind of the group up that went up there. But um, yeah, man, we appreciate the shirt. I walked through the store today. And I got some looks in Houston. They're like, ooh, they, they know the Aggies down here. So, yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Yeah, Amos, I saw the photos. Unfortunately, myself and virtually 80% of my crew has military drill once a week, week or one weekend a month. And it just happened to fall in this game. And that is why we were not there. Otherwise, I would have joined you guys. It looked like a blast. Uh, that shout out to the Aggie fans who came up to Fargo. Kind of a blowout game, but hopefully you guys had a lot of fun and kind of saw what the fanfare is all about up there. So, um, speaking of fanfare guys, I kind of want to kick right into things today with the podcast. Um, we're going to talk about some personal stuff throughout. I'm basing that off of some of these questions. So let's just kick right into the main topics because I'm really excited about where this is going to go tonight. The top seven FCS topics of the week. This is the big seven. Oh, the fans came out strong for us this episode, guys. They legitimately asked the perfect amount of 20-some questions, and they're just going to set up such good broad discussion. So touche to all our fans out there, but seven of them stood out to really kick things off uh, tonight. And we will start with Scott Moody asking a simple question. He says, which undefeated team is the biggest surprise and which winless team is the biggest surprise? Awesome question to kick things off. Jamie Williams, stats, top 25 voter extraordinaire. Who are you shocked by on each side of the house right now? Um, It's funny because I think my answer is going to be either side of a game that occurred last week. I'm shocked that Incarnate Word is unbeaten. And I'm shocked that Southern Illinois doesn't have a win. Um, Incarnate Word. Uh, I don't know what else we can say about that team um, other than I was wrong, along with about 85%, 95% of everybody else. Lindsey Scott looks phenomenal running that offense. Uh, went out and beat an FBS team, scoring 55 points to do so. Didn't really look like they were ever in trouble either. So, um, you know, hot sneak peek uh, when my ballot comes out this week they'll be in the number five slot uh just super impressed Ooh. by them um, selling illinois um got smashed by incarnate word and then uh yesterday they lost the rivalry game against uh semo but i don't know if y'all saw the end of that game there were two pass interference penalties that the first one i i'm still trying to figure out what it was uh the second one maybe 
I, I don't know. I, I that was it was close, uh, but Simo had like eight or nine chances inside the five, and they finally got one. And I, I'm disappointed that Southern Illinois um, dropped another one, but long road to go for them. So that is my um, those are my two shocks. I'm excited to hear more about Incarnate Word. We are going to feature them in another main question here in the Big 7. The background on YouTube tonight is the Cardinals. I just switched the brand color over to red. I don't know why I had it on blue. Tonight's all about UIW. Uh, it's going to be an exciting episode to talk about them. If you're used to talking about teams like Sam Houston out of the Southland or Jacksonville State of the OVC back in the day, watch out because UIW is looking to be that team this year. Kyler, you've got some shockers here going on. I mean, something that I'm kind of shocked by is, you know, William and Mary for the undefeated teams. I mean, Charlotte is a bad FBS program, but they shellacked them. It wasn't even a competitive game. And I thought that was still going to be something that William and Mary, sure, they're on upset alert. You know, they could potentially win. I didn't think it was going to look like that. And then they just beat kind of the media darling of the year, Campbell, right? And they, it was a good first half. Then all of a sudden, William and Mary really started putting their depth on. They started putting their size, their athleticism, and they started really pulling apart from Campbell. Campbell's showing they have a lot of talent, but they're still probably a few years away from being able to capitalize on that talent. So that will be a fun program to watch. But yeah, William and Mary, Bill and Mary. So they are 2-0, two dominant performances, I think, against decent caliber teams, right? Um, and then the one I'm shocked by, and it's really because of how they're losing, is Northern Iowa. 0-2. This team has been known for their defensive prowess, right? They're, they're always that team where they're like, no matter who they play, they're going to play you physical. They're going to play you tough. You're going to be in a battle. No, not really. Defensively, they look bad this year. Um, Air Force ran 600 yards on them. They averaged a first down pretty much a rush. And then they just played North Dakota, who's, you know, a pretty decent passing program. Not, not an exceptionally amazing, but a, a solid passing program threw for 11 yards, you know, on average. <laughs> so right now, you and I's defense, they just don't look the part. And then their offense actually does look slightly improved compared to last year, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be enough to get over that gap. So if you and I doesn't figure out their defense, I mean, you're looking at a, another top 25 team from the Valley going to have a, probably a pretty rough year. So those are my two, my positive one and my negative go CAA. Sorry, Missouri Valley. You know, I'd love to sit in here and just, I kind of have a little bit of maybe tweaks or input or pushback for you guys, but it will literally ruin what I have to say in like two or three of these other upcoming questions. So I'll just keep it quiet, <laughs> but I love your selections. Very, very good. And I'm going to roll us right into our second question here by Bruce Edmiston. He wants to know, he says six of the last year's playoff teams have started the season 0-2. Um, Bruce, it actually, we found one more seven for you. So this will make your question even better. We found seven teams that last year were playoff teams have started 0-2. Which ones are already out of contention for Frisco? So here are your teams, Southern Illinois, Kennesaw, South Dakota, Northern Iowa, go Missouri Valley, uh, Southeastern Louisiana, UC Davis, and Sam Houston, all starting 0-2. So uh, let's talk about Frisco, but let's talk about deep playoff run in general. So semifinals, maybe even like a good quarterfinal team. Which teams are kind of SOL? Because I got to say, if you wanted to go with Frisco, um, I think they're all out of Frisco. And I think all of them were out of Frisco before even the season started. Yeah. So, uh, but let's go with like a deep playoff run, even semifinal or a nice quarterfinal team. Which one do you just have really no faith they're going to survive, Kyler? Um, on a, Honestly, probably all of them still besides potentially a UC Davis. And that's just because we saw they, they took the number two team and they went toe to toe. They played them last year in the playoffs and South Dakota state just rolled through them, blew past them. And this South Dakota state's defense looks even better. And UC Davis went toe to toe with them. I mean, it was a 22 to 24 point game. Now UC Davis may not even make the playoffs because the big sky looks a little deep this year, but out of all of the teams that started zero and two, I think they're the only one that can even, if you get a good draw, make it to the quarters. I don't think any of them are going to be able to even get to the semis, to be honest. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with that. And I doubt any of them can make it to the quarters. But looking at how at least UC Davis played what everyone thinks of or most pundits think of as a number two team in the nation, you at least have to lean towards them. They have an FBS loss and then an ex 
extremely close loss on the road to South Dakota State Jackrabbits. So, um, yeah, that's that'd be my only pick. Kyler is normally the guy who's got the facts in his pocket. Unfortunately for this one, he's way off. Um, Sam Houston actually has no shot to make the quarterfinals this year, and I guarantee it's not going to happen. So, Well, I said uh, all of them don't have a shot to make the quarter. So I am still right. I had to, had to throw the jab in there. Um, I, I want to bounce that for UC Davis, though. When you look at their schedule, I really like your take there because, honestly, I would say it's more favorable than what you're going to see out of a lot of these teams. Uh, when you look at what they got coming up, they're going to play San Diego at home. They get Weber State at home. Weber looks good, but UC Davis, that is a home game. But then from there on out, outside of your Montana State and maybe Sac State, it's Northern Colorado, Cal Poly, Idaho, Idaho State, Northern Arizona. I mean, maybe Northern Arizona is better than we thought, but I think that's a pretty favorable schedule. And the way the Valley has been performing, because the Missouri Valley always seems to be this four or five, maybe six team uh conference that gets playoff teams maybe the big sky has that this year the way we saw with the caa a few years back and uc davis might be that fringe team we'll have to see how the bubble lands so i i really like that selection i kind of share your mentality there kyler so just wanted to expand on it a bit jamie let's get a little difference here who else who else has uh no shot or maybe even a good shot to make a run yeah i mean i agree with everything kyler said I, basically i think just about everybody's out the only other shot i see to even make the playoffs is southeastern Louisiana, and that's even to me a really long shot. Uh, they they I have played um, two FBS teams, so they're zero and two, obviously based off the question. But they play Incarnate Word at home in two weeks, and that's really the toughest game on their schedule. Uh, getting them at Strawberry Stadium, that's their only hope to maybe win that game, but. They're breaking in a new quarterback, and I've seen how Incarnate Word's played. So that's why I say I give them a fringe chance, and then I, I just don't see anybody else there making a run. Um, South Dakota, I would love to say they could make a run, but their schedule is just death. Uh, Southern Illinois, I, I think they're taking steps back. Kennesaw, nope. Northern Iowa, Kyler talked about them earlier. Uh, so, yeah, Southeast Louisiana is the only other one I give a fringe chance at playoffs and they still gonna play jacksonville state who looks really good this year too so that's that's one of those things we're like oh they, yeah. they still have just a different conference that's all i'm just thinking about them with the yeah. potential southland titles the only right. their only path yeah yeah it's gonna be really tough for all these teams moving forward you better win the conference otherwise you might be in some trouble uh speaking of playoff runs or maybe trouble that perfectly sends us into the Rev Dustin Helton's question, uh, part of the Wax Sun podcast here on the FCS Fans Nation Network on YouTube. He asks a great, great question. I cannot wait to get into this discussion. How far can Missouri State go with their porous defense, says the Rev? The 2-0 and Bears out of Missouri State um, have defeated Central Arkansas 27-14 in Week 1 and went on last week to beat a ranked Tennessee Martin team avenging their loss in the playoffs last year, 35 to 30 with Arkansas on deck. All right, gentlemen, what do we think about Missouri state? You guys, we were tweeting about them. We had some threads going, uh, overarching opinions, Jamie, I'll let you kind of jump into it first. And I'd love to have a nice little round table here on the bears. Um, yeah, well, I, it's one of those like wait and see kind of things. They play South Dakota state at home and then at North Dakota. So a couple of, uh, bigger games coming up. Um, but to me, they're going to go about as far as Jason Shelley can take them before he gets just beat to heck by the crappy offensive line that they also have. Um, but I also don't want to take anything away from Tennessee Martin. Kind of a coming out party for Tennessee Martin's quarterback dresser win. He looked really good. I know a lot of people were probably watching uh, the Bills obliterate the Super Bowl champion Rams. I know I was, but I did have the, that game on my phone. Love the back and forth there. So I don't want to take too much away from Martin when talking about uh, Missouri State, but like I was saying, Jason Shelley, he just looked even better. Uh, he, to me, is a solid Walter Payton candidate. Uh, just he operated that offense to a point where even when you thought that they might get a stop from Martin, they didn't. And he would take the team down and they would score. And they needed every bit of it. So I think they're going to go offensively, obviously, as far as Shelley can take them, but he's going to have to be in some shootouts. Uh, or that's where they'll fall, and that's what happens in the playoffs. So they're going to see somebody 
in the playoffs that that has a better defense than what they're going to see and you know you don't want to get in a shootout at that point in the, in the season that's what that's when it'll catch up to them yeah jason shelley is unreal he's going to get chris strevler from usd for the walter payton award he's going to lose out to somebody with a, a few better stats but that dude I mean, if the Walter Payton, which it is a stats award, I understand that. But, man, if you want to talk most valuable, I tweeted this out. I think Missouri State wins, like, two more games. I think they win, like, two games total without Jason Shelley. I think they are Misery State without him on the roster. They He's got a few good weapons. That interior offensive line, I hammered it in the spring. I hammered it last year. It is awful. It is terrible. It was like a tidal wave of bison every play. And Missouri State was beating NDSU last year because Jason Shelley was just making plays. The guy is a monster and deserves a ton of credit. I am very surprised the defense is so bad. Defense is not good either. I expected with some transfers and the growth in that area that they would be a lot better. But I think Jason Shelley is just unreal holding up what is a very uh, rickety old ship that could fall apart at any moment. And Jason Shelley is just riding the waves out. I don't see them getting past round two. And that's going to be my stance. I'll put a taco belt bet on it, maybe, because I don't see, you know, UT Martins and other teams. They're they're really, they're good. They're quality, but those are teams that like get to round two, and everyone's like, "Yeah, awesome! That's so cool!" And I don't think that game should have been that close. I think there's a lot more that Missouri State should have been capable of. So, no, I if they're a quarterfinal team, they will have exceeded my expectations. Not a chance in heck are they making the semifinals, and I'll stand pretty firm on that. So, uh, Kyler, do you have more positivity about the Bears, or am I just tearing them down too bad? I actually don't think their defense is as bad as everyone's making out to be. Sure, they didn't perform well against UT Martin, but, I mean, Colton Dalwell is a beast. He, he's potentially going to be a potential NFL, you know, maybe a free agent type of player. He's big-bodied, 6'3", 215. He can do everything on the field. But, I mean... They played really well against Central Arkansas defensively. So if, if we're just judging them off of a half of a game when UT Martin started coming back, I think that's actually a little unfair. But now what Matt pointed out to the offensive line, we can judge them on the offensive line because like Matt said, in the spring, they looked bad last year. They looked bad this year. To me, they even look worse than they did last year, that offensive line. So I kind of agree with what you guys are saying that they can go as far as Jason Shelley allows them to go but I actually don't think it's that much of a big deal about their defense, uh, especially when you look at their schedule. Sure, they they have South Dakota State, right? That's going to be tough. They play Arkansas next week. Then they go play North Dakota. That is a tough three-game schedule, especially because North Dakota, they have a quarterback who can throw the dang ball too. So you'll we'll get to see if their defense is up there or if it's more just that offensive line that's making them struggle a little more than they probably should. But then the rest of the – year i mean they avoid north dakota so that's nice southern illinois doesn't look too hot you and i doesn't look too hot western illinois not too hot south dakota we'll see it's, they don't look too hot to start the year youngstown state they played no one so we'll see but they didn't do very well against them and then they play indiana state who's not very good either they actually have a favorable schedule so if if they can go the next three weeks and maybe lose two out of the three South Dakota State and maybe Arkansas State, if they can win one out of that three, they have a chance to be an eight seed. And if they're an eight seed, I think they can get to the quarters, uh, something like that. So, I mean, I'm excited to see how they're going to perform, but I really don't think I'm going to judge the defense as much as everyone else is. But that offensive line, you need to protect your guy. If he gets injured because you're not able to block for him, you have no shot the rest of the season. So figure out something. Give Jason Shelley a little bit more time because he's putting the team on his back. I mean, he does have really good weapons. Their wide receivers are really good. Yeah. But it is Jason Shelley, his wide receivers, that's it. <laughs> so uh, please protect this guy. Uh, we're all rooting for this kid. He's so much fun to watch. Yeah, I kind of like the running back there. I just like just the offensive line so bad that – Unless he's getting on a swing pass, uh, I think it was number 31. I, I really like the kid. I, 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 his name escapes me. Mm -hmm. um, I really like him, but it's, it just echoes y'all's point about that offensive line. Yeah, it was um, right. Jacardi, you're right. Yep. 
Yeah, I'd like to. Right? I butchered that. I know I butchered it. <laughs> I mean, I'd let's say the defense has improved 25% from last year. I mean, you know, last year's defense was bad. I mean, it was a bad, bad defense. And uh, just going through, I'll just the points they gave up, I'll skip the first game. We'll go FCS. 34, 23, 20, 41, 7, 27, 28, 28, 27, 24, 32. That is not good. <laughs> that is like, and if if they're improved 30%, that still means Jason Shell in the offense has to score a ton of points. So I can see your point, color that the events honestly may be unfairly judged, and I should give it a little bit more time. But I don't think they're taking some sort of big step up to protect them um, come playoff time. I think if they hit a balanced team, they could be in a lot of trouble. For, for sure. sure. I just don't think it's their biggest vulnerability right now. Oh, yeah. Not even close. You're right. No, the offensive yeah. line is totally that, that's, the worst. That's kind of what I was saying. Yeah. I think their defense is middle of the FCS. Yeah. It's not great. It's not horrible. We see way worse defenses. My yep. team's playing way worse defense right now than Missouri State. So, right. I mean, if we're looking at that, their defense is very middle of the FCS now in terms of playoff caliber teams, probably on the bottom side of a playoff caliber team. Yep. But it's not their Achilles heel. Their Achilles heel is protect Jason Shelley, which right now, I don't know how they are. I mean, he's he's getting hit. He's getting rushed. He's doing whatever he can. I, I kind of feel bad for the dude. Oh, yeah. I can't imagine Jason Shelley behind NDSU's offensive line. I can't even fathom what Woo! that would look like. It would that be insane. Nice. <laughs> Um, we we'll, might cover the bears here a little bit further in our quick hit questions, but for now we'll move on to what I think Kyler's going to have a really good insight on. And he's been, you know, kind of hammering a little bit. Um, this question comes from Nicholas deal. And he asks after this weekend's results, is it safe to say the big sky conference is the deepest in terms of playoff caliber teams? Great question. Cause, uh, the CAA ain't looking too bad either. So what do we think there, gentlemen? I don't think it's the Valley at this point based off their performance. Is it the big sky? Is it CAA or am I missing somebody? What do you think, Kyler? I think both the big sky and CAA have some deepness. Now, the only difference between the big sky and probably the CAA right now is the CAA has playing quite a bit easier teams. Uh, just being like Towson, they're 2 0. They played what? What was it? Bucknell and some other not great team. So yeah, I don't know if, if they can oh. get through their actual CAA schedule, but that's the typical CAA model. You're having very week at a conference schedules even jamie's admitted it in the past and then because you know you're going to play a gauntlet in the actual conference but overall the ca still looks quite a bit more improved than it did last year but in terms of the missouri valley versus the big sky it's only week two right we next week's the big week i think that will prove a lot but as of right now i mean i rank seven big sky teams in my top 25 and i asked you guys am i just freaking crazy because i couldn't fathom it <laughs> But, like, I had a credit. NAU just beat Sam Houston. Sam Houston beat them, what, 47 to 17 or something last year? And they added more depth. They added more scholarships. And NAU just kind of played their lights out. Um, so, I mean, you have to give them credit. You have to give Weaver State credit, who just demolished an FBS program. And it's it's not a bad FBS program. Maybe they're going to be bad this year. But this is a Mountain West champion, top 25 team last year. In the last five years, they've had two... 10 plus win seasons or something like that, which pretty good in the FBS level. And they just put a beat down on them. Then the two Montana schools look solid. Sac state has a, a really fun game with you and I coming up. Right. So we'll get to see where they're at. But I mean, in terms of playoff caliber teams, if I had to end the season today, which I'm glad I don't, there's six to eight teams from the big sky who are going to be playoff eligible. I see four teams from the Valley. And then you're probably looking at about six teams from the CA who are in that playoff contention as well. So uh, I think as of right now, the big sky week two, again, week two, week three, this can totally change. There's some big, big games um, coming up, but as of week two, they do look like the deepest conference, man. Yeah. The big sky is looking really good right now. Uh, we Idaho. Holy crap, I know. Idaho. Idaho's playing great. Toe-to-toe -to -toe with two FBS programs and one one's ranked who just beat Wisconsin or should be ranked, something like that. Yeah, I, I mean. I saw SDSU's final scores and Idaho and Idaho Idaho's playing. I keep thinking, what the heck is going on? It's just, it's crazy. I keep getting confused. I uh, J there. Jamie, I uh, stole that from Jordan Fingston. So Jordan, if you're listening, yeah, I saw your tweet. Um, Jamie Williams, do you think the CAA right now is matching the big sky in depth at all? And uh, honestly, we're not going to talk about the Valley because 
it's obvious. It's the depth is not as large right now. Um, I think the CAA can match the big sky in depth when you're talking about how many teams, but what the big sky has that the CAA doesn't have. And we've talked about it all off season in the last couple of weeks is a bona fide title contender. Now, might that change if Delaware keeps playing the way they do? Sure. You know, Villanova, sure. But there's some depth there. Richmond, we talked about William & Mary. Another game, 270 rushing yards. You can, If you could run the ball in the playoffs, you can win. William & Mary is probably the CAA team set up best to win in the playoffs. Now, I don't know if they're going to wind up with, you know, the matchups and the right draw and, you know, if they've got that talent. But they've got a strong defense. They got a huge offensive line. They got good running running backs. And the funny thing about them, and because I'm just going to take the moment to talk about William and Mary, they've got three guys that they run out on the field at the same time that have all played quarterback at this level. So they've got Hollis Mathis, who was their quarterback for a couple of years, Darius Wilson, who was a freshman last year. Oh, and by the way, they have Kalen Newton, uh, the last name you recognize because his brother is Cam, and Kalen led. Howard to that big upset of UNLV a couple years ago. So they use these guys all over the field. So I just want to take some time and just pump William and Mary up even more. Um, I, I think they're going to be a dangerous team, they're, but they just add to that CAA depth that we've been talking about. But yeah, the answer to Nicholas question, I still think the big sky is just a smidge deeper and a, just a smidge stronger just because of the top of the big sky versus, versus what the CAA has. Yeah, Montana, in my opinion, is a an absolute threat to win the national title. And I think the CA we might need to be a little bit more cautious, like you said, Jamie, in terms of who exactly is there. But depth of the big sky looks good. And I can just hear the SoCon fans and Kevin's and others about rotational schedule. It's going to screw the seeds, screw everything else. So I look forward to that annual Twitter fight in about two and a half, three months. So. Um, in terms of fights, boy, we might have one going down in the desert next Saturday. Uh, Dylan Grunland and Brandon Anderson both ask questions. Dylan says, seriously, Arizona looked much more like the team we thought they would against Mississippi State. How will NDSU fare knowing the likelihood of playing in some brutally hot conditions down in Arizona? Brandon Anderson says, could the time zone and kickoff time be Arizona's best players on Saturday? Um I'll take a quick second, then I'd love to get your guys' reactions on this. Uh, the best players, uh, Arizona brought some guys in. And I keep tell, telling Bison fans, their QB's good. Their quarterback's going to perform really well. It's a new culture. It's a new coach. This is not the same Arizona down in the dumps team that was last year. So I think Arizona absolutely can beat NDSU on Saturday. I think how they're going to fare. The bigger question is, how is Matt Frazee going to fare? My wife's going to be out of town for the weekend. I've got three boys, one who's a 10-month-old six and four and that game kicks off at 10 and it's going to be done at 2 a.m and then my human alarm clocks are going off at 5 30 so how am i going to fare is the real question to survive to watch the game in terms of the actual game itself though i think ndsu if they pull this one off doesn't win by more than 10 points i think it's actually going to be a lot better more competitive game than people think um, but as I've been telling other folks, I think Cam Miller's going to cook like he has been cooking. I don't think people realize how much better he's gotten again. So, yeah, I think to expand, a, I kind of went off track there. Specifically on the question, Brandon and Dylan, in what realm would I doubt NDSU's preparation, whether it's time zone, heat like in Kansas State, um, cold weather, rain in Frisco, anything? I would never doubt their preparation. And I think Arizona actually will be a more formidable opponent for NDSU. Uh, guys, I know, of course, we always want NDSU to lose. Uh, what do you think? Do you think the Bison are going to come out on Saturday with a victory? So I'm not too worried about the heat in Arizona, right? Um, it's super dry. It's, it's not going to be like Kansas. The humidity, I think, will make you cramp more than just a very dry heat. I say that from experience. Moved you know, to Arizona for a long time, lived there, now live in Houston. It is just different. The humidity is what makes it brutal to play in from my point of view. Um, I don't think Arizona is that much better than they were last year. I think they're improved, but like everyone was like, oh my God, San Diego State. They, they just whooped on San Diego State. Now I'm starting to look at the whole Mountain West as a whole and go, man, the Mountain West looks like a glorified 
Big Sky Conference at best right now, right? Utah State was their number one team. They just got crushed by Weber. Nevada was a top-tier team from the Mountain West. They just got beat by Incarnate Word. San Jose State was a solid team. They just went competitive toe-to-toe with Portland State. Wyoming, they were competitive with a bottom dweller in northern Colorado who just got beat by, you know, Houston Baptist. So when I'm looking at kind of the Mountain West in general, I go, I don't think that's as good of a win as playing, you know, North Dakota right now, North Dakota State. So I still think North Dakota State has a good shot. I think it is going to be maybe more competitive than we thought in the preseason, um, or at least than I did. I still think North Dakota is going to roll past them. If, if Do you know what the spread is? Have they even come out with that? I have not seen that come out or if, anything yet. If it's like a seven-point Arizona game or a 3.5, I think I'm going to bet on North Dakota State to cover and, and even just win outright. Um, I'm not as sold. Now, Mississippi State is a solid program, right? Mike Leach, he's not just – turning it into a dumpster fire, maybe off the field issues and just because of his personality and stuff like that. But he's a solid coach. He does a good job. They were a bowl team last year. I mean, Mississippi state is a solid team. So yes, they defeated Arizona pretty badly, but I mean, Mississippi state is a good team. I, I, I mean, so I think Arizona is a little bit better than they were last year. I don't think they've made exponential jumps. I think there's still a lot of issues going on with that program. So yeah, give me give me NDSU. Yeah, it's going to be a really good game. I just think that's one thing is a lot of Bison fans think like um, we're going to go down there, we're going to whoop some tail. I don't think this is going to be like SDSU last year going to Colorado State no. and just putting the woodshed no. to them. Like they just have more talent than a low tier yeah. Mountain West team. Yeah, it's it's a Power Five team. It doesn't matter how bad they are. It's a Power Five team. So um, I I'll be very shocked if this is an Iowa State style of game in 2014 where NDSU ended up winning 34 to 14. I think it was that would. That would shock me. Yeah. Um, Jamie, you got the bison here with a victory, or, or what do we think? Well, Matt, what is what does North Dakota State do best on offense? They absolutely avoid good teams. <laughs> they schedule they schedule pioneer teams. <laughs> the best thing they do is undoubtedly run that ball, power baby, offensive line. Yep. Yeah. Um, Arizona allowed already so far 138 yards a game running the ball. Uh, so I think the key for the bison control the clock and that's something they can do and, and they have the depth to control it. So I, I think that if they can just grind that ball on the ground, they're, they're, they might run them out of the stadium. I mean, I'm not thinking, you know, two, three, four score game. I think it's definitely closer than a certain fan base would like to think it's going to be um, outside of a few regional people. But, you know, I, I do see, the bison coming out with the win. I mean, I know like Kyler said, the mountain West is terrible, but um, just want to let y'all know the Sunbelt's not, especially the East. <laughs> yeah. But I, the, the AP polls value a win over Eastern Washington more than a Sunbelt team beating Texas A&M ridiculous. or yep. Nor- Notre Dame, which means Eastern Washington and big sky is still more respected than the fun belt. That's so right. It is That's what right. it is. <laughs> we put some respect on the belt's name. <laughs> Uh, from an FCS standpoint, guys, this game's really intriguing to me because, like, this is your silver lining of hope, in my opinion. If you're SDSU, if you're Montana, if you're a CA team that's up there that you guys have faith in, Montana State, I guess, is still in the, this kind of realm for the seeding, right? If NDSU wins on Saturday, they can lose to SDSU at home 50 to nothing, and they'll be 14 and one, and they'll be a one or two seed, and they'll be in Fargo through the playoffs. So like this game is big because if you were Montana or somebody else and you wanted to avoid them, maybe NSU ended up being a three seed or something, they have to lose this game and they've got to trip up in the Valley. They've got to have two losses. If they've got one loss, we know how it goes. They're going to share the Valley title or win it. And so I think that's a big takeaway nobody's talking about. You might as well lock in the one or two seed even more than you probably did in the preseason if they win on Saturday. So if you want the Bison to have a chance to trip up the season, they've got to lose if you're cheering against them, against Arizona. It won't hurt them in the polls, but two losses will affect them come seeding time frame, in my opinion. So um, speaking of seeding and that stuff, guys, let's get into our final Big 7 question before our quick hits. This is great. Mike Conlon Jr. asks, is the gap between the top four and the rest of the top 25 still as big as you thought preseason? Great question, Mike, because 
that's really what everybody hammered. You know, it was like we have our four national title contenders, the Montanas and Dakotas. Some teams come after that. Now that we're seeing the rise of Incarnate Word and a few of these others, Jamie, you did the 130 preseason rankings. What do you think? Do we have as big of a gap still or no? So it's a little nuanced, but yes and no. Yes, the, the gap is still there, but right now to me, it's between one and two and everybody else. And by two, I mean Montana. South Dakota State didn't even eclipse 300 yards of offense for the season to like the third quarter yesterday. So yeah. I, yeah. I want to see a little bit more from them. Uh, Montana State, you know, again, let's see. Um, they look pretty good against much lesser opponents. So I, I think the gap's probably closed from those two to the rest, especially with an incarnate word. Now, if you go from five to six, I think there's still a gap because I don't really know who number six is. Maybe it's Delaware right now. So I think the gap at the very top is still pretty wide, but I think three and four have kind of come back to the pack just a little bit. Not not to the point where I'm you know picking major upsets or anything like that yet, but they've come back a little bit to the pack. Yeah, Jamie, you kind of we share the same mindset because that's how I feel. I just think the gap, and I, I I'd still I'd still keep South Dakota State in there for now. I think they could really click and figure out that offense. They've had some injuries and bang ups, but I I just I, I don't have a lot of faith in Montana State this year as much as I did in the past. So I think the gap between the top three and the rest of the top twenty five is still there, even with Incarnate Word and the way teams are playing. But yeah, Montana looks real good. Uh, we'll have to see how that all plays out. Kyler, what's the gap look like for you, dude? Definitely the gap between the four and the rest of the top 25, I think, is closer than years past. Um, I, I'm more with Jamie where I think it, it's kind of a two-headed race right now. I mean, we just saw South Dakota State. Everyone's number two. After they just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Iowa, who's a really good defensive team. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Iowa. Um, but they just went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the sixth best team in the big sky at home. Then you see, you know, Missouri State. They're going toe-to-toe -to -toe with UT Martin again. I I think it's a maybe even just a one-horse race. You have NDSU. I think there's a big gap between one and two. And I, as of right now, if South Dakota State played Montana, especially if it's at Montana, if Montana does business and goes undefeated, they're getting home field throughout the playoffs. And I said this even in the preseason before we started seeing performances, South Dakota State is not beating any of the Montana schools at their own location deep in the playoffs. I just don't think it's going to happen. So I think there's a really big gap between one and two. And as of right now, I think there's a decent sized gap between two and three. And then I think three and four are pretty close with probably four or five other teams. And then there's another little gap. And then, you know, there's a bunch of teams who could probably upset a team every now and then. But um, I actually think besides North Dakota State that, we could have a really fun playoff field again like last year. There was upsets. There was some shocking defeats. I, I think we're going to see quite a bit of that again. That would make it a lot of fun. And um, I'm going to just keep this conversation rolling into what I apologize, what is actually our final question of the Big 7. Because you're talking about playoffs, you're talking about upsets. Christian Salzar, who I believe is new to our page, asks about early playoff predictions. But specifically, what do you think the ceiling is for the University of Incarnate Word? So let's talk about the Cardinals a little bit and some playoff stuff in week two. Why not talk about the playoffs, right? Um, let's talk a little bit about the Cardinals and what we think. Are the Cardinals the type of team that are well-rounded enough in all areas after what they did last year, what they're improving on this year, coaching everything, to be that team that scares a South Dakota State, a Montana State, um, maybe a really good CAA team? Don't even talk about NDSU. We'll just throw them out. But but everybody else, what's the ceiling for this team? Can they can they make it? What do you think, Kyler? Do you, are you feeling, Jamie? What do you think? Is this the same? Is this a Southland team that gets too hot on offense and is going to fizzle? Or can these guys do it? What do you think? I mean, looking at their schedule, they <laughs> have a good. really good chance to go undefeated. Oh, yeah. Which means... They may not have to travel to those northern teams. If they go undefeated and have an FBS win in a Missouri Valley top 10 win, you're looking at a top three seed most likely. Maybe top four if something else happens. But you're looking at potentially a top three seed because they have the out-of-conference. It's not just they're relying and we ran through the um, Southland just like Sam Houston did. No, they have the out-of-conference schedule. 
and it's a pretty decent schedule. One easy game with Prairie View, two really tough games that probably not many expected them to win. And all of a sudden they did. And who's beating Southern Illinois by 40 points and even in the Valley? Maybe one, maybe two programs. That's just what they did. So as of right now, if I'm looking at the schedule, as long as they don't slip up, which right now if they're playing the way they do, they're not going to slip up. They have a chance to be a three seed. If Montana and North Dakota State go undefeated, they're probably locking up the top two. But then you have another undefeated team that's getting the three, which means everyone's coming down to the south, going to Louisiana for them. They don't have to travel up to the snow. I think traveling up to the snow would be their biggest deficit because of how they play, how they sling that ball. As an Eastern Washington fan, I know some of our own home field games, I think, have hurt us over, you know, playing in cold, playing in the snow. And I think that would really make it tough for Incarnate Word to travel up to a Montana state, to travel up to a South Dakota state and get the W in, in December. But if some of these teams got to travel to them with how they're playing, no one has looked better than Incarnate Word to start the season. I'll, I I am comfortable saying that. I, now, does that mean I think they're the best team? No. But no one has looked better than them to start the season. And if they get home field advantage, at least until the semis, they have a shot to at least make it to the semis if they get that home field advantage. Maybe quarters, because they're going to get another good team. But I think anything under the quarters from how they're playing right now is a letdown. Um, they're they're playing fantastic ball. They may be the new Sam Houston, and who would have thought that after they lost their head coach in Cameron Ward? Not me. I, I, I messed that one up. I effed that one up. Um, they look better. They look better everywhere. They look really, really good. Yeah. And, uh, still on the, uh, Southeastern Louisiana hit from last year, Kyler, uh, San Antonio is what you meant for location. I knew you meant San Antonio. Oh yeah. Over Louisiana. yeah, yeah. Yep. It, Drew I by was that. Thinking of, yeah. Sila. Yep. So they're going to hate me there. Southeastern Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And Jamie, you always are super brutally honest when you think a team isn't balanced enough to make a run or do certain things. How do you feel about this Cardinal team as we end the big seven here? I mean, I'm not going to take up a lot of time because everything Kyler said was what was on my mind. I was looking at their schedule and I don't see a loss. Like I said a little while ago, the only shot at a loss is probably Southeast of Louisiana there on the road. But the way they're playing, it could happen. If it was, if Cole Kelly was still there, sure. But in Carnet Word, that team, that offense, it's not going to be slowed down until they play somebody not in their conference. Uh, the only thing that could hurt them in the seating is that they do play this Faulkner, whoever that is, some probably some D2 mm -hmm. team. Yep. So that might hurt them, but so but they're still going to get a seed. And based off of that, it's probably, like Kyler said, a top four seed, which means semifinals have to be the expectation at that point. Can, can I add just one last thing? Because oh, this, yeah. so, this is so dumb to even think of. Lindsey Scott Jr., and this, this is why we just have to keep giving him props, because I was so wrong, so wrong. Right now, he's 35 for 50, 800 yards, <laughs> 10 touchdowns to one interception. He almost has as many touchdown passes as incompletions. Jeepers. In the front two games of their schedule was what everyone thought was their hardest games that they had no shot. And he is, I mean, we gave props to Jason Shelley. We gave tons of props to Jason Shelley. Jason Shelley's not even playing remotely at the level that Lindsey Scott is. That's how big of a gap right now in just pure on the field play is because we just gave Jason Shelley, Walter Payton props. All three of us were like, he is amazing. He's doing everything for that team. Lindsey Scott Jr. is making it so where no one, no one's even going to be in the realm. If he can just match this play, which I think he's going to be able to, this is his award. This is his season. Holy crap. He's going to earn a lot of really cool NIL stuff from an FBS team after this season. No, no, no. We hope you stick around because holy crap. You, you never know. Well, what he's you're a senior. Gonna, oh, he's a senior this year. Okay. Well, enjoy that NFL though, because that <laughs> yeah, CC guy's playing amazing, which is great. Um, guys, we'll have to see how UIW plays out. It'll be exciting to see how uh, things play for them on their schedule. Very favorable for that seating in the future. Christian, thanks for uh, submitting a question. Like we always say, if you're on FCS Fans Nation, if you're on the page, if you submit a question, we're going to answer it. So no excuse for us not to talk about your team. Okay, guys. I meant to pull this out a few weeks ago, but I got behind on the editing and stuff. It's time to do something a little fun. So 
There is a gentleman on our page, Brian Thompson, and oh. he stayed with us in Frisco last year and hung with us quite a bit. He loves making taco bets on the page. He makes bets for tacos, and then he sends gift cards. We've seen people post uh, gift cards they've received from Brian when Brian gets his bets wrong. We've seen Brian post him eating tacos when he gets things right. Last year for Brian staying with us, he was like, I'm buying everybody tacos the night after the game, and he bought this gigantic spread of tacos, which was so good. A great way to end another Frisco trip. So we are doing every week now. I'm taking one fan question. It's a question they ask about the podcast, and I'm twisting it into a taco bet. So if Jamie, Kyler, when you guys see the questions and agenda come out, if you see something on there and you're just like, man, I can kind of formulate this into a bet, we're going to make it into the taco bet every week, okay? So here you go. Enjoy the new intro to Thompson's Taco Bets. It's time to put your money where your mouth is. And if you're right, put some tacos in there too. This is Thompson's Taco Bets. Thompson's Taco Bets. <laughs> so great. The background being all the tacos he gave us last year in Frisco. So, Brian, I warned you. I hope you were paying attention to this podcast because you're about to be famous on it. And, guys, I'm going to be using for the taco bet this week uh, Mr. Adam Peterson's question. We'll pull it up here. Um, he is very, very, very disappointed in his Illinois State Redbirds, uh, just to say the least. And Adam says, after barely beating Valparaiso, how ugly is the Valley season going to be for Illinois State? Be as brutally honest as you can. And looking at the Illinois State Redbirds schedule, I am going to propose a taco bet that the Illinois State Redbirds are only winning two more games the rest of the season. Adam, I think you're in a lot of trouble. I think the team is terrible. Now, here's the thing. I'll pull up their schedule for you, gentlemen. I think there's about three games they possibly could win. So if you think they're going to pull off three Ws, I would love for somebody to try to counter me and take this taco bet. They play Eastern Illinois next week, and then the rest of their schedule, they've got Indiana State, Western Illinois, Youngstown. So maybe four, but I think they're only winning two more. Jamie, are you going to ignore the taco bet or do you accept the taco bet and think that Illinois State's actually going to win more games? Under. Taking the you're taking the under, you think they'll win less? Yeah, they don't look very good. Ooh. So uh all right. Um Kyler, what do you think? They're winning more than two games for the rest of the year? Yeah, I think they're gonna win more than two. Um okay. here, here's one of the reasons why. Five of their next nine games have yet to win a game yet, right? We just talked about the Missouri Valley doesn't look that strong right now. We'll have to still wait. It's still really early in the season. I think they can win Eastern Illinois, who hasn't looked great. I think they have a chance versus this new, not improved Southern Illinois. We'll see. Um, they definitely have a shot versus Indiana State, who didn't look very good against North Alabama, right? They they barely got through North Alabama. I bet you Illinois State would beat North Alabama. And then you got Western Illinois, who's not good. So I think there's... I think they probably win three games. Uh, I don't, I'm not, you know, putting the field and saying they're a playoff team. They don't look very good. <laughs> but um, two games out of the next nine? No, two games. Be over. I, I, think I think they'll they're win bad. three. I think they'll win three. Eastern Illinois, Western Illinois. They're going to run through Illinois and they have a chance to beat Southern Illinois. So they may <laughs> be the best team in Illinois still and be this bad. That's how bad the value is. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. So the taco bets out there. Uh, if Illinois State after this week wins more than two games, Jamie, we each owe Kyler one taco. I'm going to track this entire thing, and we're going to buy the total amount of tacos when we're in Frisco, and we'll take a cool picture of actually how many each of us earned. So uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, we'll, whoever's down there with us in Rainbow uh, Row and everything, you can share in the taco festivities. All right, guys, that'll be fun. We'll do a taco bet every single week in honor of Brian, but we will do what we do every week and hit our quick hit questions. Just because your question is answered quickly doesn't mean we don't care. These are the quick hit questions of the week. All right, guys, I have these kind of set out for each of us individually, rotationally to answer. So this should be pretty cool. Kevin Madalls asks... This is a great question. Checking out scores around the country, it surprised me to see so many solid defensive games, 20s, maybe low 30s. We started to see a switch back to more of a focus on defense instead of the spread attacks of the last decade. Has NDSU's dominance had something to do with that? Kyler, you are always a huge proponent of 
defense doesn't win championships, balance does, and you have such good arguments there. But are we seeing people look more into defense, or is this just kind of a down offensive year? Um, neither. I mean, we just we just showed you Jason Shelley's offensive. We just showed you Incarnate Word's offense, right? I don't think anything's changed. Maybe just perception of some of the other teams. You still have all of the strong defensive teams that you've seen the last few years, right? The only big difference is Montana's playing better defense now than they did before Bobby Hout came back. That's the only team I see a difference. The other strong defensive teams, like I mentioned, you and I, not playing good defense. I don't think anything's different. You're seeing the top tier teams, North Dakota State, Montana, South Dakota State, Montana State, all playing very balanced football. They're playing strong defense, strong offense. You're able to not just run only. You can throw when you need to. You're not just throwing only. You can run when you need to. I don't see anything different, to be honest. This is two weeks into the season. A lot of lopsided games still. Oh, out of conference schedules or sometimes it is what it is. But I don't think anything's different besides Montana now has a better defense than they did three years ago. And Northern Iowa has a much worse defense. Other than that, it's the exact same. All right. Things are sticking the same there, Kevin. Uh, guys, Jason Plotkin wants to know, how hot is the seat for the coach at Northwestern State right now? There's a new AD. He's working with a contract after this year. And now, right now, Northwestern State sits 0-2 to start the season. Um, I kind of had a little bit of a take on this. It kind of depends on the program, right? So they're 0-2. That's not good. And uh, Coach Lurid down there, Brad Lurid, has not been good since 2018 when he was hired. He was 5-6, and 3-9, and 1-5, and 3-8, and eight, and now they're 0-2, which is bad. But Northwestern State is bad. They have not been to the playoffs since 2004. They haven't won a playoff game since 1998. So um, I think he's probably on the hot seat. It's not like people are happy. But you got to understand in the FCS, there are a lot of cultures and teams where sometimes, you know, we, we they, they just have teams. They just have programs. And like winning is not like the forefront for a lot of programs. It's really sad, but it's just sadly the reality. So I think honestly, if he has another bad season, he could still survive as crazy as that sounds. So, uh, Jamie, this one's great. If you guys haven't been on the page, Jason Plotkin, who just asked the last question, and Dustin Elton, the Rev, have the funniest little fan rivalry between each other. Um, after SFA, which is Dustin's team, lost last week, Jason asked us if we did a welfare check on Dustin Helton to make sure he's okay. Uh, but Jason, as the Sam Houston fan here, Dustin asks, are you guys worried about Jason Plotkin after the Sam Houston poor <laughs> offensive play and getting shut out in eight quarters? Jamie, are, are we oh, we think Jason's okay? Think he's doing fine? Uh, he's probably okay, but I think at this point, Jason and Dustin need to put the Find My iPhone app or whatever the heck you can do on each other's phone so they can look. And if it's in the middle of the river after one of the games, then then be worried. Uh, you know, they can go check out, check each other out. I, I don't know. I, I think they're probably okay. Uh, maybe they had some tacos. Dustin was probably in the pool. Hopefully he doesn't drown. Uh, you know. They're around too much water, those two. Yeah, so, yeah. you know. I, I think yeah, yeah. Just put the put the find my iPhone so they can check on each other. <laughs> That's it. I, that I, is I the that straight just, solution. Just, I'm just little advice just to make them a little bit more self serving. I like that. Good call. Um, speaking of good calls, are uh, the man Jacob Martinez been on the page as long as anybody and running our pick'em challenge right now on the page. Super shout out. Appreciate you, Jacob. He said, "Is Samford for real? They gave up an average of 240 rushing yards a game last year. Right now they're at 150." against Kennesaw run his team and uh, a team called Georgia seems to be a pretty good football program. Uh, so Jacob wants to know, we're going to round table backwards now. So we'll go back to you, Jamie, and we'll work around. Is Samford for real? You starting to believe a little bit? Uh, we'll see. Um, maybe they look really good against Kennesaw, uh, but the world isn't about run defense, uh, but that is a huge improvement, uh, especially against Georgia. And I know they got shut out 33 to nothing, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, let's let them get into that uh, SoCon schedule and see if Sanford really is a team to, to worry about because I thought that was a two or three team race. Maybe it's a four or five team race and Sanford can be one of them. I think they've got a big one this week. I think they've got East Tennessee State. Yeah, if you can take the torch from Kennesaw, I think you've got a chance after what we've seen from the last half decade. Uh, next question, Joshua Hoffman from South Dakota State. Joshua wants to know, biggest disappointment so far, Stephen F. Austin or Southern Illinois? All right, everybody gets one one-word answer here because this is pretty good. Uh, for myself, I am definitely going to say Stephen F. Austin. 
I may have promoted them a little bit in the preseason. I don't know. We'll, um, we'll have to rewatch the tape. Stephen F. Austin for me. Kyler, what do you think? Definitely Southern Illinois for me because Stephen F. Austin has the record I thought they would have. So, I mean, this is what I predicted. I thought they would start one and three or, you know, only beat Alcorn. So, yeah, Southern Illinois. I did not expect this. Let's dust the shoulders off. Which one you uh, most disappointed in, Jamie? Um, Both. Uh, but more so Southern Illinois. I mean, as as his theme this year, I was dead wrong about Stephen F. Austin. Uh, looks like I was wrong about Southern Illinois too. But yeah, bigger disappointment is is the Salukis. There you go. Uh, Kyler Brad Jans wants to know with little brother UND in the Missouri Valley now and them squeaking out a win against UNI. Does this make them ri- the Richmond of the Missouri Valley? As everybody always says, Richmond sucks. Is UND in that realm? Nope. Just because, um, for one, Richmond has actually won things. Uh, <laughs> oh, a little dig. Sorry, former uh, Big Sky team that you've never beat Eastern Washington ever. Um, no, I, I just think UND, I mean, Matt, you said this a long time ago. I was kind of a believer in this too, that they would be more successful in the Valley than they are in the Big Sky. It's not because maybe just this year, the Big Sky is a little better. But um, it's not because we thought the Missouri Valley was weaker, but they're going to be playing regional. They don't have to travel. They don't have tons of the different elevation changes, element changes. We think they're going to be a more prime program in the Missouri Valley. But only, I think, really, JMU hated Richmond. Outside of even like only half of the NDSU fan base, some just don't even want to admit that they don't like UND, which is a little weird to me. I think they're just, you know, being a little petty. But um, nope. UND, you got to win some things. You got to make deep playoff runs. You got to win a national championship. You know, do all that type of stuff before you can say you're the Richmond of the Missouri Valley. Yeah, they can't even meet that standard, which is um, right now a little upsetting. But hopefully, do they wear UND... sweater vests of their game in, in uh, Grand Forks? No, just hockey jerseys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yep. they're not that, even close to Richmond. That's the same thing. I don't know. That's the same thing. <laughs> Shut that's... your mouth about hockey. Hey, <laughs> a, a hockey jersey. In Canada is the same thing as a sweater vest in Rich or uh, uh, Virginia. That's well you said. You wear them both to weddings. You wear them to business <laughs> meetings. You wear them to interviews. It's the same thing. It's the same fair. thing. That's <laughs> yeah, good. That's fair. Well said, <laughs> Jamie. Um, you often have things that are well said about top twenty fives. And Chris Matthews, an awesome Govs fan who possibly has some stuff heading our way these fans really want their gear repped in the podcast reach out to us guys we'll wear it um he says have the governors done have the govs done enough to earn top 25 consideration jamie what do you think um yeah they're gonna be in my top 25 when it comes out this week um i know it's just the last two games are just presbyterian and mississippi valley state but it's also a combined 104 to zero and they gave western kentucky about all they can handle now, they should easily beat Alabama and A&M this week. It's two weeks from now that I'm really interested in. They host Eastern Kentucky. So really, really intriguing game, especially after what Eastern Kentucky was able to do this week. So, yeah, right now they're in my top 25. Very good, my man. All right, which remaining FCS versus FCS non-conference game piques your interest the most? Alex Kenkel wants to know. I have two answers for you, Alex, right here. Um, UND at NAU is a super intriguing FCS versus FCS non-conference game coming up. They're both one and one. They both had FBS losses. And then just this last week defeated Sam Houston and UNI. NAU beat Sam Houston and UND beats UNI. So top 25 wins, but like, where do they stand? Because we learned nothing from the FBS blowout, but we learned a little bit from like, ooh, they upset these teams. So I think that's super intriguing. And then you have to go with Sacramento State at UNI because you have Sacramento State, top 25 votes, uh, played really well against their FBS opponent, got a good win this last week. And now they're going to go to UNI, who is just desperate. And the question I want to know is, is classic UNI going to win this game, especially at home, and somehow get to over 500 and be in playoff consideration? Or are they actually dead in the water? So I think those are two really good games to kind of uh, take a look at Kyler. Are, do we have more FCS over FBS matchups left uh, where we can actually see defeats happen? The FCS right now has six total wins. Brandon Owens looked up uh, Garrett Meyer on top of that one to jump on and ask about the closing gallot 
talent gap. Is there a talent gap that is closing in between the FCS, FBS? And um, a final little question to tag on there, Jim Poppin. He kind of wanted to know the same things, but he was also curious about, um, is it even worth for these Power 5 schools to have some of these FCS teams come in and possibly beat them? So all-encompassing, what do you think about FCS over FBS games this year? And is this something Power 5 should even consider? So for one, you know, we've had, what, six upsets so far? I think that's what it is um, off the top of my head. Um, the gap is interesting. I still think, like, the elite of the elite, the top 25 recruiting programs, a massive gap, an absolute massive gap. Now, the rest of maybe what I would consider the G5. I think with the portal, how it's working, we are losing less players and receiving more than what I thought probably was going to be possible with the portal. We're receiving double the amount of transfers that are dropped down from the FBS to the FCS. So I think the bottom half of the G5 and the top half of the FCS, they were already kind of in a similar recruiting base. You get the same talent of players. They just typically get more of them. But now we're stealing way more of their FBS recruits than they've ever had. So um, I think that the gap's closing in that aspect. But still, the top-tier teams, the Ohio States, the Alabamas, the Georgias, Texas A&Ms, there is still a massive, massive, massive gap if you're not Jackson State. Um, just a, an app. And even then that's still a massive gap in actual talent. So um, did I answer the questions? I didn't even yeah, hear Yeah, No, that's great. I just wanted to bounce off something too. I figured uh, I, I kind of combined all those. A uh, few more upsets could happen. Uh, Stony Brook at UMass. UMass is trash. Mm -hmm. um, Jacksonville State at Tulsa could be interesting. Jacksonville State looks a lot improved. I think that's an intriguing one. And of course, we've already talked about it. We'll see what NDSU does up at Arizona. So Here's yeah, here's see. one that I want to throw out. I don't have a lot of faith that they're going to get the win, but I think it's a little sexier than what I thought maybe in the preseason. UT Martin at Boise State. Jamie, you, you just nod your head. That's kind of what you were thinking too. Because yep. like Boise State, now Oregon State may be a top 25 team. They they didn't look very good against Oregon State. And then New Mexico has kind of been a eh, program. But they weren't like light years ahead like the old Boise days. Um, and the Mountain West just looks really bad this year. Um, so, I mean, again, I think Boise State will still win by 14, 17. But when this game was announced, I thought this was going to be a blowout. I don't know if it's going to be a blowout. There's some talent on UT Martin. This could be a fun, maybe three-quarter back-and-forth type of game before finally the depth uh, just kind of rolls over UT Martin. But um, I'm actually really excited to watch that game. I think it'll be fun. Cool, cool. It should be a good one to watch. Final question. It's going right back to you, Kyler, here. Uh, Mr. Adam Healy, holy moly, a fight on Montana. One of the newest podcasts to join the FCS Fans Nation Network on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe to Fight on Montana on all listening platforms of YouTube, especially. If you guys subscribe to the FCS Fans Nation podcast and network here on YouTube, you're going to get all the podcasts we have. And Adam Healy wants to know, uh, if you were to re-rank the Big Sky teams with two games in, with the Big Sky rocking it this weekend, what would it look like? Any major changes, Kyler? I know you had some interesting takes on Weber and others before the season even started. Top five, six teams, how would you kind of rank them in the Big Sky right now? Yeah, I, I did a Big Sky power ranking. Um, it's a little different than my just team ranking, my top 25. But what I think the better Big Sky teams, Montana, this is in a row. Montana, Weber State, Montana State, Sac State, UC Davis. And then this is kind of the confusing one. If we just looked at right now, Idaho, then Eastern Washington, then NAU, Portland State, and then you got the bottom dwellers of Cal Poly, Idaho State, and Northern Colorado. So that's how I would rank it if you just asked me if the season ended today, what were you most impressed with? Who do you think could beat the other teams? Montana, Weber State, Montana State, Sac State, UC Davis, Idaho, Eastern, NAU, Portland, Cal Poly, Idaho State, Northern Colorado. Wow, has his own team top seven, biased, unbelievable bias, top seven, unreal. That's like uh, saying top seven's like uh, when the Mountain West tweeted out about being having five teams in the top 44 or whatever it was mm -hmm. <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> Not even a real thing. Did you see the other Big Sky tweet that just because do you remember like last week? Oh, they yeah. were saying the North yep. Nebraska one, and they were like, No thanks. Did you see the newest one? No. So someone went, That's it. Can we just trade Weber State to Utah State to the Mountain West? 
And then the big sky just posted trade rejected. <laughs> <laughs> who is running that account? Hire I know, but they're, the, they're by far the best. And then the girl who like originally made that, she commented under just shut up. <laughs> like she was so offended. <laughs> This guy, oh. man, it, it's been it's been flood. Whoever's running that page, you deserve a kudos. There's a big savage running the big sky oh, yeah. Twitter account, and it's phenomenal. Um, speaking of, I don't even know where I'm going with that. It's time for the game of the week. This is the matchup you should be paying attention to. This is the FCS Fans Nation game of the week. All right, guys. So we're gonna roll into our final segment, the game of the week. Recording on September 11th, Sunday, 2022. Again, of course, never forget. We hope your Memorial Day went well of that tragic event. And um, remind us that we're one nation fighting together. So beyond that, we will get back into some football talk with right now the rankings where we are recording. 2-0, and number 10, Delaware, is traveling to 2-0, and number 22, Rhode Island. So... We have a top 25 matchup. I anticipate both these teams being up a little bit in the top 25 rankings by the time you guys listen to this episode on Monday night or Tuesday. So let's start with it. Uh, what do you think there, Jamie? You got CAA battles right here. You had some faith in Delaware earlier in the podcast. Who's taking the victory and what's the score? So this exact game, it took place last year uh, at Rhode Island as well, back-to-back years. So that's a little interesting. And Rhode Island won 22-15. to 15. But... Delaware did not have Nolan Henderson. And we do have a good quarterback matchup, which was Henderson and Kasim Hill. Um, I think with the new coaching staff and a little bit more explosive offense that the result flips this time. And Delaware will go into Rhode Island and win 24-20-ish. Close game. Uh, I, I think Rhode Island is for real. I think they've got a shot at a playoff berth, but I think Delaware is just a, a smidge better. So I'll, I'll take the Blue Hens uh, by four. This is an insanely tough matchup to pick, and I'm going to slightly give to the edge to Rhode Island just based off of so close last year, built so much, um, but I think I think what they bring back is good. I think they're the home team, so I'm going to slightly give it to Rhode Island. Uh, Delaware, very impressive what you did against Navy, but I'll say Rhode Island wins this one. I'm going to say 28 to 21. Kyler, what do you think? Battle of the CAA, top 25. Yeah, this is such a weird matchup because they're two two of maybe the top four programs out of the CA this year, probably it's kind of what I'm guessing, but also like their schedules are interesting. And I don't know who's the real two and O who's not like Delaware surprisingly did not look very good against Delaware state last week. I mean, they struggled in three of the four quarters. Now, luckily they, they did extremely well in the third quarter, but it was, it wasn't a blowout by any means. Yes. They won 35 to nine, but like three quarters of play, it was back and forth. It was a fun game. Um, where Rhode, and, Rhode Island, they played Bryant, who, you know, they just went toe-to-toe with FIU, which is a little weird. I, I didn't think – I think it was Bryant, right? I didn't think Bryant would be able to go toe-to-toe with FIU, who's a really bad FBS team. But I still – there there should be a big gap there. Um, so, I mean, Delaware has the Navy win. Rhode Island's best win is, I mean, maybe Stony Brook, who's probably the worst team in the CAA or pretty close to it, maybe. I mean, Jamie, we'll see. He's, he's kind of staring at me into my soul, so maybe I'm way wrong on that one. Um, I, I like Delaware in the matchup. I believe in Nolan Henderson. Uh, but, man, this is this is an interesting game. Yeah, give me Delaware 27, Rhode Island 21. So we all at least agree it's going to be in the 20s <laughs> in some form or fashion. It'll be interesting to see Blue Hens or Rams who takes that victory and how the rest of the games play out. And of course, we're going to be here to answer all your questions in next week's episode. This has been the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Holy moly, gents, this was a really fun one. Thank you so much to all the fans submitted questions. You set up a perfect agenda for us. We look forward to answering more in future weeks. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast if you're listening right now on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, especially on YouTube. If you just have the app on your phone, click subscribe. That is the main driver right now for us to be able to continue to fund this thing and put more money and effort and additional things into it. So YouTube has been a great thing for us and all the podcasts on our network. You'll get access to well over eight podcasts and shows, which is pretty sweet. Um, Make sure you join the FCS Fans Nation Facebook and Twitter pages, and you can interact with us throughout those things. Jamie, final thoughts, my man, before we roll on out for the week. Well, yeah, I'm pretty excited. Uh, tickets go on sale for Frisco this week, finally. That's right. So uh, if you want to 
know where we'll be. Uh, just keep a lookout for at FCS Fans Nation on on Twitter, on the Facebook page. I'm sure somebody will be throwing out where our seats will be. If you want to come hang out, join us. Uh, eventually, we'll figure out our, our tailgate plan and hopefully a podcast, maybe a live one down there too. So uh, we'll see, but that's the excitement there. Yeah, we uh, we definitely don't have an Airbnb with a lion statue and a pool. That definitely does not exist. So, or maybe it does. We'll that have YouTube to see. Money. What's that? <laughs> that YouTube money. <laughs> that YouTube money. Yeah, we wish. If Mike we... Tyson and his tiger are coming too. <laughs> yeah, if it was YouTube money funding this thing, we'd be uh, just sitting outside the stadium waiting for the game to start for four straight days. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much. You guys are just the best thing that happens for me on a Sunday. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week. And I look forward to getting more questions from FCS Fans Nation. Thanks so much for listening. We'll catch you guys in the next one. Boom. Thank you for listening to the FCS Fans Nation podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on your preferred listening platform, whether it's Apple, Spotify, Google, or even YouTube. And make sure to follow our FCS Fans Nation social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for listening to the premier podcast for FCS football. Bo. Thursday, I know a lot of people were watching. Kyler, are you are you are you still there, Kyler? Yeah, I'm still here.